Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining us here today. And I'm gonna apologize in advance if there's a whole bunch of undoctored cuts in today's video because I've been watching my niece and nephew a little bit this past week and I've got what I'm gonna affectionately call as the chitlin sporosis going on up here and I may go into <laughs> unreserved coughing fits. So again, apologize in advance. Now, a few months ago, I did a video dealing with night vision and paints. We had some interesting results in that video. And I also mentioned that some of the phenomenon that we saw in that video also occur in different types of clothing. And I asked you guys, well, hey, would you guys be interested in a dedicated video? The response was a resounding, unmistakable yes. First, how I obtained the imagery for today's video. All the night vision images that you will see are filmed through a Generation 3 white phosphor PVS-14 mounted on my hard-headed veteran's AT ballistic helmet. If it looks a little shaky, there's no image stabilization on helmet. Conditions. I specifically picked a night with heavy cloud cover for total darkness. I didn't want any light pollution whatsoever. The PVS-14 was set to IR on mode, which throws its own low-grade IR beam. That is denoted by this red bulb here that you can see in the corner of the screen. The reason why I used the IR on mode was we needed some kind of signature to be able to see, and if it can pick up IR light bouncing off of the clothing, then it can pick up all light bouncing off the clothing. So remember that in most situations, unless you've got a canned situation like what we've got in today's video or you're out in the middle of nowhere, generally speaking, there's gonna be some ambient light pollution. The reason this video took so long is because I went out and tried to get manufacturers to send new in box clothing samples so that I could perform this test without any ever having washed them or anything like that. And we'll get to why that's a problem towards the end of the video. But I had no success. It was completely fruitless. And the only thing that I can think of why a company wouldn't want basically free press is they were concerned that their clothing would not perform very well. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but I was like, you know what? I can do this by myself. I've got so much clothing that I've accumulated over the years that this should not be a problem to find something that kind of meets all the criteria. However, I did still have to pay the bills. And for that, today's video is brought to you by Max Arms. Max Arms is a purveyor of surplus accessories. I kind of think of them as a variety pack type website. They're one of those ones that I keep on my refresh tabs because I never know what kind of cool stuff that they're stacking deep in the warehouse or whatever. To the point, I bought an AUG parts kit the other day. It's still in the box. I don't even know where that box is. It's around here somewhere. I haven't gotten to it yet. I don't even know what I'm gonna do with it, but I thought it was cool, so I bought one. So since they're in the surplus game and they asked if they could help produce some content here at the channel, I said, well, let's do a spot check on them. And I was scrolling through their website and I saw grade A and grade B AK-47 magazines. Can you think of a better gauge than a random assortment they dug up in some backwater country in East Europe? I can't. So pedal on the right, boys and girls. And as you can see, as far as AK-47 magazines go, these are essentially the same picture. Like Max Arms is trying to do their best to help out any of those special snowflakes that managed to worm their way into the AK community. Now, I can't link to Max Arms because while the majority of the stuff that they do isn't regulated property, there are some things on the site that they do. And of course, the rules from the powers that be prevent me from doing that. But I'm pretty sure that you guys can figure out the browser function on your internet. And I want to say special thanks to Max Arms for making today's video possible. Now, the last thing that we have to do before we actually get to the night vision component of the video, there's a few things that I have to clear up. And it's clear from looking at the comments on the patent video that this is the case. Number one, night vision performance is very dependent on environmental conditions. Number two, I want you to think of everything that we touch in today's video as a form of camouflage. Camouflage, usually when we talk about it, it's some kind of pattern that's been applied to the subject for the purposes of breaking up its outline against its backdrop. Backdrop absolutely does matter with night vision too. You would not go out and use green camouflage in the fall time because you're gonna stick out. You also would not use fall camouflage when it's snowing outside, you will stick out. Same thing applies to night vision, only 
The challenging part is that the pigments that you are used to seeing do not act the same way. Don't mistake me. The physics is exactly the same. The only difference is it's being passed through an intensifier tube before it gets to your eye so that you can see it. And basically, the easiest way to describe that is instead of this wide range of colors that you could see, is we've condensed it down into a narrow range. And because of that, you're not gonna see things the same. And then number three, which is directly related to that phenomenon. We care very much about the reflectance and fluorescence of the clothing articles inherently. Not only that outline and matching our backdrop, but also the inherent characteristics of the material that our clothing is made out of. If that article of clothing emits any light, either through chemical problems or an external light source reflecting off of it, then that is going to appear as a very bright signature on our night vision device. I know you guys want to get into it, so I'm just going to save my theories for afterwards. Let's start with our trash option, which is t-shirts. And I'll have all the color images and composition tags on screen for all the clothing items that we use throughout. Basically, t-shirts are reflective. You get slightly better performance out of an all cotton t-shirt than out of a poly mix, but not much. As far as breaking up your backdrop, any kind of writing or logo whatsoever is definitely a problem. Moving on to pants. I wear a lot of jeans. We have a pair of Victos gunfighter jeans here. And then also two other just random types of pairs from my closet. One of them is considered a stretch fit and the other one is just a regular jean. The Victos pair clearly has something special going on here. In my opinion, is there something special going on with that pigment that they're using? Because these jeans do not look like regular denim as far as the pigmentation of the jean is concerned. The denim is not a color that I have ever seen anywhere else on the market. Continue with pants, we have some tack pants. These are Vertex. One is in tan and the other is in multicam. While this is much less impressive than the jeans comparison, this is licensed multicam and there's definitely a difference in performance here. I threw in a pair of gym shorts. Don't use gym shorts, but go figure Adidas sweatpants are less reflective. This is a Core Essentials gun belt, and this is the nylon one side, leather on the other side. If we flip the belt over, we can see that the leather backing is substantially less reflective. So, leather belts. Hats. Basically, you can see a trend developing here. The cotton hat crushes all the others. And also, I'd like to note that this multicam hat is not licensed multicam. It's also a flat brim hat. Don't buy flat brim hats. Let's move on to jackets, and I have four examples here. The first is a waterproof shell. It's basically worthless. As you sort of would expect, a water repellent surface can't be very porous at all. Notice that the camo is basically not there in this respect. Next, I have a cheapy water resistant jacket that I picked up at a department store at the last minute. An outdoor research jacket, which is one of my favorites. You guys see me wear it all the time. It is a waterproof membrane jacket, which means that the outside layer is not waterproof, but it will not get all the way through the jacket. And then for the heck of it, I threw in a hunting vest. Notice that the best performing was the outdoor research, and I'll sum up why in the outro. But the differential fabric on the vest, I find more interesting than all of that combined. Look how terrible that camo is. There are a few other things that I wanted to show you, like the towels I use to keep everything dry between the showers that were occurring. Notice the pigments don't seem to matter at all. I also got this shot of my boots when I was returning the exact same spot every time to make sure that I was getting a uniform shot. This is rubber. This is fabric. I'm not sure what it is, but they suck. I definitely need to rub some mud on those. And this is my nylon bag that I use to haul everything out there. You can see the Victos jeans poking out the top. So what the heck is going on here, guys? We had similar fabrics that are performing differently depending on how they were integrated into the article of clothing. Well, I have my theories. Number one, the weave is the most important factor when determining how a fabric is going to react to a light source. Let's go back to the t-shirts for a second. While the cotton t-shirt performed the best out of all of the t-shirts, even against a black one, they still did not do well compared to some of the other products that we've looked at. The reason that is, it is all a tightly woven piece of fabric that is designed to form a single layer for the purposes of being just a general purpose shirt that's not going to keep you warm. Really, it's just there to kind of cover you. Because of that, 
the light is going to come in and it's basically going to reflect off of the surface because there's no depth to the fabric. Number two, composition. An organic fiber is going to inherently be better at scattering light than concentrating light. And there are exceptions to this, but basically there's a lot of disorder when you talk about a cotton fiber as opposed to something that's synthetic like a nylon, for instance. The order of the fiber being a long polymer is going to be more likely to be reflective than if it's just a jumble of basically cellulose. Number three, pigments. I'm not trying to spend 20 minutes on pigments, but remember that there are different modes for uptake and sequestration of those pigments in organic fibers versus synthetic fibers. And I'm just going to leave it at that, and there are exceptions to all those rules as well for each material. Remember that you can have a pigment reflectance problem and a pigment absorption problem. So if we go back and look, we saw the, the Victos genes and we saw the uh, licensed multicam versus the unlicensed multicam. We also saw that vest had some dark spots on it where I would say that you can have just as much problem with too dark than you can with too light. And number four, and this is what we're gonna do in closing, enhancers. And an enhancer is a compound that is in your detergent, and your detergent almost certainly has it if you bought it off of a shelf, unless it specifically says on the package that it has no UV enhancers in it. You might be able to get baby detergent. But actually, you know, that doesn't really work because a lot of people use their children as fashion accessories these days, so that probably is inaccurate either. I don't know that that's true. Anyway, if it doesn't specifically say that it has no enhancers in it, then it definitely has enhancers in it, and you should treat it like it has enhancers. Anyway, it boosts the color signature from the clothing. That does that by reflecting more light. That is bad when we're talking about this whole equation. You don't want that. So, that's the whole reason I wanted to get new in-box clothing for this project because I was concerned about the UV enhancers. So, I had to put together my chemistry degree <laughs> and go after this stuff. So. In preparation, the stuff that you didn't see in this video were the multiple hours of prep of all these clothing articles to be able to not have UV enhancers. So to do that, if you look at most of the structures of a lot of these enhancers, they're usually some kind of polar mo molecule that has got a low molecular weight. Usually that means that it's gonna be soluble. So hot water it is, very hot water to try and draw that out or even hot enough to maybe degrade it would be good without, of course, destroying the clothing. Then I dried it outdoors, rewashed it in a detergent that doesn't have UV enhancers, hand washed it again with hot water and then of course put it back outside and the idea being that a lot of the degradation of those types of compounds are related to heat, light, and oxygen. So I did my best to get it out. I'm not gonna say that I got 100% of it out, but all the clothing in today's video is going to have less of it than your stuff that's currently sitting on your shelf in your bedroom that has been washed through your washing machine. If you'd like to see a follow-on video where I do some testing on different detergents and enhancers and things like that as far as they relate to night vision, then sound off in the comment section down below and let us know. It also helps out with the algorithm if you do that. If you like today's video, then also leave a comment. If you're shy and you don't want to leave a comment, then you can also support the VSO Gun Channel on our affiliates pages as well as our crowdfunding pages like Patreon and Subscribestar, which you should see some of those people on screen right now.